three, two, one. Lift off. Twenty years ago, most people would have laughed at the very idea of New Zealand sending anything into orbit. But now, we've got Rocket Lab leading the way, you know, a globally important space company. Um, and then the government saying, well, what else can we do in space? It's not just our government asking, what are you working on? But you've done really well. I think you punch way above your weight in terms of being one of the top three, I think, in uh, launch um, locations. Some like it here so much, they're staying. Our job is to take someone's idea and turn it into reality. As a new generation of Kiwi scientists leaps into the boardroom and beyond. As soon as you start talking to investors, there's an absolute focus on the customer. Uh, you know, what does the customer want? Uh, how much are they willing to pay for it? They need to see that there's a multi-billion dollar company at the end of it for them. Working on how to make decades of discovery pay off. I'm seeing it over and over again. I'm seeing people who signed on to be scientists and researchers, they end up becoming entrepreneurs. The sky is not even the limit. They've already reached orbit because... No matter where on Earth you're standing, it's pretty much the same distance to get up there. So why not start from Petoni or Lower Hutt to greater heights? In 2024, New Zealand's $2.7 billion space industry supported 17,000 jobs. So says a Deloitte study for the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment. That's a big beat to cover for Business Desk startup specialist Greg Hurrell. As soon as you start looking at the space industry, you think, oh, Rocket Lab. Now, great company, but to, to me, they launch rockets. And there's only so much you can write about launching rockets. I've found uh, other companies doing some very interesting things. Greg has brought us to Paiho, Robinson Research Institute in Lower Hutt. Ben Mallett and Bart Ludbrook are nearly two months into a series of experiments. The team is monitoring a device they call Heki, the egg. Inside it, a magnet like this. Which got called a uh, steampunk bagel. Because it was about steampunk bagel. Because <laughs> it ended up being about the size and shape of a bagel. All running remotely in orbit outside the International Space Station. Here's the delivery flight. Two, SpaceX, not one. Rocket Lab. It's also an illustration of the problem they hope to solve. 90% of a rocket's mass at liftoff is the propellant it needs to get off the ground. Even once a craft reaches orbit, it's burning fuel to manoeuvre and dock. There isn't really a solution yet to move this kind of mass around in space cost-effectively. Cost so the existing technologies rely on really scarce and expensive propellants, or they rely on chemical propulsion, which means you're going to be needing sort of, you know, hundreds of tonnes of fuel to move 10 tonnes of, of payload. Inside this vacuum chamber is what they hope to prove will do that job in space vastly more efficiently. It's an ion thruster. That's like the opposite of the rocket that launched that up to the space station, which is like mostly fuel, huge and heavy. This produces just a tiny amount of force. All you need to function in the zero gravity, frictionless environment of space. And it's pretty. Iron thrusters are a form of space propulsion where you accelerate uh, charged atoms um, uh, and, and you, you throw them out the back of your spacecraft, just like a, a jet engine. But um, rather than burning chemicals, you accelerate them using electromagnetic fields, electric and magnetic fields. Because iron thrusters use solar energy to provide that energy, they're more mass efficient. You're not taking up all that mass of chemicals. So this is a very important technology for um, maintaining satellites in space over long periods of time, being able to move them around, keep them in the right place, and for deep space missions. This here is the, where all the magic happens. So this is the superconducting tape. Crucial to it all is a superconductor, which at its most super basic is... Yeah, it's a, it's a wire that conducts electricity with no resistance. And the really useful thing about that is you can make really, really powerful electromagnets out of it. 
if and only if you've put in decades of work understanding how certain advanced materials can perform, like they did here, starting in the 80s. When the news came out about superconductivity at uh, higher temperatures, they worked out the structure of one of these materials, and then they went and got a patent for it. And they have managed, and this, their successors have managed to successfully defend that patent through challenges ever since. And that's a, that's a key sort of piece of their technology to enable us to operate these magnets uh, really efficiently um, without needing sort of really large cooling infrastructure. Paiho lives on the Callaghan Innovation Campus, named for one of Victoria University's famous physicists, Paul Callaghan. He challenged us to reverse the brain drain and make New Zealand the place where talent wants to live. Robinson Research seems to be living up to the challenge. I get to learn from these people who are world experts in this field and pick up a little bit of their knowledge. And uh, for me, that's uh, so much fun. Bettina Pavri is a senior principal engineer here, applying wisdom from 30 years at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. And to share what we've learned with the team here and to have it pay off uh, in the HECI experiment now in space has just been really rewarding. So it's paying off, it's working? It's working well. Uh, we've been really delighted with how well it's been going. Uh, it's actually going amazingly smoothly compared to the testing that we did here in the lab. Which Do we is... touch some wood at this point? And yes, just... <laughs> absolutely. I'm going to touch the wood. Like, uh, I don't know how but, superstitious uh, you are. Like... <laughs> well, you figure it can't hurt, right? Yeah. Uh, but no, you want to find all your problems on the ground. So that's what our test program was uh, focused on. So far, the experiment has shown they can super cool their magnet 200 degrees below zero in a vacuum so it can become a superconductor. So we want to show that the uh, flux pump and the superconducting magnet can survive the journey to space and operate successfully there for long durations. And when we bring it back to Earth, show that there hasn't been any degradation. That's an important part of the story in turning this into a commercializable product. But in parallel with that, we said, why not do some bonus science? Working with German and Czech scientists, they're also testing if the magnetic field Hecke creates could shield people and equipment from radiation in space or from the heat of re-entering Earth's atmosphere. Shields up, ion drive engaged. Yeah, this that's is right. sounding yeah. a little bit <laughs> Star Trek. That, that, that's Star Trek, or uh, if you are a Star Wars fan, I'll point out that the TIE fighters are twin ion engines. Coming in. So we are building ion engines here, but no TIE fighters. Not yet. Funding a sequel to this research will require another Hollywood favourite, the spin-off. Once the basic research is done, and some of the applied research is done, admittedly, if you want to commercialise something, there aren't any government funds for that. It's, it's up to the private sector. A government commitment of $71 million over seven years for advanced materials here will help, but it will have to fund a host of programs, not just this one. We have money to continue, particularly the sort of more basic research, you know, understanding how the iron thruster operates, what its limits are, where the performance gains could be found within that technology. Um, what we don't have is the uh, money to build like a flight system and, and put it up there and run it. That, that would, uh, yeah, that, that would stretch our budget too far. So better to do that with private money, I think, and then they capture the, the commercial outcome as well. Ben and Bart are leading that piece not just as engineers, but as founders, directors and majority shareholders. Yeah, so the company is JXB Space Systems, uh, and it's, the intention is to take this technology that's been developed here in the lab, you know, from New Zealand government funding and commercialize it and turn it into these, these really high power thrusters to move spacecraft around. We've had to learn a, a lot about what a good business proposition is, what a good market is, what a go-to-market strategy and tactics are that make sense. So I feel like there's been a complete pivot for me from a technology focus, um, you know, understanding how these things work, how to make them better, um, doing research, publishing papers, to as soon as you start talking to investors, there's an absolute focus on the customer. Uh, you know, what does the customer want? Uh, how much are they willing to pay for it? You know, we've had uh, 
talks with investors where we start explaining the technology. They're like, I don't care. You know, I, I, I trust you guys are good at the technology, but tell me about the customer. The discussions with those customers, potential customers, become technical very quickly in terms of what their requirements are. Again, it's been really important coming to these potential customers, not just with our, our back technical backgrounds, but with the, the kudos that you get from having operated your superconducting magnet in space, from having set up a really nice test facility and got all of these, these results from, from the team. That brings a gravitas, which, which is really important for, for getting, getting you in the, in the door there. Some are already knocking on that door. Last month, the lab was on the list of stops for a trade delegation from Colorado, executing on a memorandum of cooperation signed by their governor and space minister, Judith Collins. Now more than ever, it's really important for subnational diplomacy and for building friendship and relationships with um, other markets. And I think that's something we're trying to do is, uh, is really establish a long-term relationship and commitment to the market. Our free trade deal with the EU has them looking too. Airbus have uh, come and been here in the last few months and had a look, good look around. They're very interested in what Robertson's research is doing. Where we're sitting now in Petoni is where they're working on hydrogen electric aircraft engines that could, if all goes well, power future aircraft the size of Airbus A320s, for example. We've got MRI systems, which I think would bring great medical benefits uh, to people if they're pushed through to completion. The Heki experiment is close to ticking off all its tests. The orbital part is almost done. Getting it back could take another year waiting for the ride down. They need to see that there's a multi-billion dollar company at the end of it for them. Uh, so you need to have this big sort of 10 year vision. But then you do need to break it down into your kind of immediate milestones, like what are we gonna do in the next two years with the money? The first thing we'd love to do is demonstrate the thruster in space. So the HECI mission that Robinson have done have demonstrated the superconducting magnet in space, sort of a, a key component. And the next thing we'd love to do is demonstrate the actual thruster operating in space. That's our big milestone that we'd like to achieve. What's gonna to take to make that happen? We're working on it. This money doesn't get launched into space. It gets spent here. It gets uh, spent not only for researchers here at the university, but on machine shops and people who build electronics and cables. It turns into jobs. It turns into uh, excitement. It turns into opportunity. Do we actually have a space industry beyond Rocket Lab? Every time I look, I find something else going on. There's support services. Um, there's a, there are tracking services for tracking satellites. There are all sorts of niche companies, um, not just in space, but also in um, the upper atmosphere. It's um, a little bit like when Peter Jackson started making films that sparked a film industry of a scale well beyond what we thought was possible before Peter Jackson came along. And before Peter Beck came along with Rocket Lab, no one would have ever suggested we were going to have a space industry here. But yes, we do have a space industry here. Generation 2 is coming. Generation 2 is coming.